Well, as I said, they, we have to revitalize the Palestinian Authority, which means giving the support that is necessary for good governance. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. <laughs> Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the libs. It's time for our main event. Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. We are again sans Smugglesworth, which we are disappointed by, but we should have him back in short order. Right, it, fellas? It's a shame because there's so much good news to cover today. I wish he was here, but our friend is out there on the road. As always, fighting for the conservative movement. <laughs> exactly right. That is what he does. What you heard up top there were some remarks given by the vice president of these United States, uh, taking leave of her senses once again, fellas. Yeah. And it appears as though she has zero historical understanding of Palestinians or their relationship with Israel or the Palestinian uh, liberation uh, as she would call it, it seems like, uh, you know, perhaps this is somebody who's not done due diligence on this set of f interesting facts. Well, taking leave of her senses is something that's become routine for the <laughs> vice president of the United States these days. And she said it against a backdrop of more anti-Semitism spreading across the country. Cities around the United States are seeing an incredible number of Huge crowds, Hamas supporters, attacking regular old American people because they happen to be Jews. Yeah, and we're going to get into all of that and more here shortly, but just a stunning statement of ignorance, right, old man? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's sort of like, uh, I think the modern left has embraced the horseshoe theory of the neoconservatives in some way, where it's like, we could, if we could just nation build here, we could win the hearts and minds they throw roses in the streets and gaza would be a 21st century the ghost of yasser democracy the ghost of yasser arafat but you, know, you, you get that sense that there's like a naivete that's sort of swept into politics on the left today and i think in the same way that that was on the right to some extent with, with regard to the middle east and i i think it's like all you have to do is open a history book to realize this is folly um but they're going to try their level best. But also, it's just a whale of a theory to be like, what they need is more international aid. Yeah. Because that hasn't fallen into the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> Working with our allies. Millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards. A few big box retailers want to take those rewards away. Rewards we use on groceries and school supplies. The cash back to save on gas and grow our small businesses. And travel miles we use to make memories. The so-called Credit Card Competition Act would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help mega retailers line their pockets, we pay for it. Tell your lawmaker to vote no on the big box bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com to take action today. You know, that's all. That's always my favorite thing. I've mentioned it previously on the show, like whenever a Democrat is asked about foreign policy, like their fallback, fallback, like our fallback domestically when a, like a candidate doesn't want to know the specifics of the issue is always waste, fraud, and abuse. We're going to cut the waste, the fraud, and the abuse. And with foreign policy, Democrats have the same crutch that they lean back on, which is like working with our allies and building consensus across the globe. That's what they always say. <laughs> and it never fucking means anything. And no. it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to take a, a tough decision in which you make a morally clear argument. It's just always... Oh, we're going to... More aid. More, more aid. aid. More aid. And it's not as though Hamas is interested in intercepting any of that. No. There's no record of that. <laughs> There's no record of that. All right. As I said, we're going to get into all of that and more. We have a special guest on today's program. Uh, the one and only Dana Perino joins us. It's a long time coming. She's been a long friend of the program and us personally and is a terrific human being. She'll tell us a lot about her career and how she's gotten to be where she is and her interests and in things like country music. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you'll have to stay tuned for that. Real treat. A real treat. A real treat. And I got to thank everybody, by the way, for their uh, stopping by the old online store. Mm. 
because it is the Christmas season, and it turns out uh, a lot of people want roofless gear. Yeah, you love to see it. You love to see it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing. There's no better stocking stuffer. That's right. Are we still have? Do we still have deals, Wolf? We can start a new one. Let's start a new deal. That's, I don't know what the deal is at some point, maybe at the end of the program. Well, you'll, fi- you'll find out when you go to store.ruthlesspodcast.com. Oh, look at that. It's a special surprise. There'll be a deal there. There'll be a deal just- By the, t- <laughs> just by the, t- the time this airs, there will be a deal. <laughs> just waiting for you. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the uh, politics writ large, old man, I couldn't help but notice some of your oh, you're, displeasure. You're going to rile me up. Yeah. At the <clears throat> college football- playoff and the selections that were made yes uh the things that have stoked your ire more than anything it seems to be the absence of florida state an undefeated acc champion Mm -hmm. that has not made it into the college football playoff yeah you just want to put a quarter in the slot and let me go here i just want to pull the pin okay um okay well uh i think i'm just going to go ahead and make everybody angry do it okay so number one um Alabama fans and sort of the SEC writ large. Great team. Fantastic team. In that SEC championship. <laughs> you know what I mean? The thing that offends me isn't that Alabama got in. Because when Alabama plays their best, they are one of the best. I, I think that's not in dispute at all. Right. The problem is, in order to make that argument, what Alabama and these SEC fans had to do was parse the entire schedule of Florida State. A Florida State, by the way, that scheduled LSU to start the season on a neutral site and just destroyed them. Destroyed LSU. Three touchdown victory. Went into the uh, swamp with their backup, who then gets a concussion and wins the thing with a redshirt freshman, third string quarterback in the the swamp. But like the Alabama and the SEC fans will look at the SEC championship and be like, well, Alabama, obviously, and best team in the country. (laughs) You know, they beat Florida State by three touchdowns. But it's like, if you're going to parse the entire schedule of Florida State, again, a team that's undefeated, 13-0, and and be like, well, you know, they didn't look so good in the ACC championship, again, with their third-string quarterback because the second-string guy who started all of one game is in the concussion protocol, and be like, ah, you know, I don't know. I don't think they're, they're good enough for the playoff. And it's like, what? I saw you guys almost lose to a high school RPO by Auburn the week before. <laughs> and you won uh, with a fourth and 31 Hail Mary. Right. You know, how about how about for those? It just takes a lot of audacity to be like, we are unblemished. Our record is perfect. We are the best conference in all of college football. (laughs) Well, I think that's what it boils down to. The audacity of it irks a lot of people is there is no situation where you could imagine this team of people who picks what the college football playoff looks like is going to eliminate the SEC altogether. Right. I, I, I get that. They're I not mean, going to. They're not going. They're just not going to. No. Even even though, I mean, look, every team controls their own destiny. Win all your football games. Just, and they, win, just and win them all. Yeah. Just win them all. And it's not like, it, with me, with Florida State, it's not like we're talking about liberty here. Right. We're talking about one of the most successful programs in the last 30 years. No question about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is an iconic football program that was overlooked by two one-loss teams. Right. And and two one loss teams who, by the way, played each other. Yeah. So and, there's no there's no like hypothetical there's no hypothetical of being like, oh boy, you know I don't know, you know Jordan Travis went down with an injury, he's not going to be in this playoff. If only these other teams had played each other, and we could determine who was better. Maybe the team that lost by two touchdowns at home. <laughs> you know, I I mean look, I, I, I and I say all that half in jest because look, I understand the committee's decision. I think it was a cowardly decision. Because it sort of splits the baby. Because you could make a decision, okay, we want the four best teams in college football. In which in, in which case you would have Georgia and Ohio State. Georgia and Ohio State, you wouldn't have Washington in this. I mean, look, I love Washington, 13-0, and, and you won your conference championship. Right. So you are deserving in the same way Florida State is deserving. But you could make that decision. You could say the four best teams in college football, only the eye test what we saw on the field. You wouldn't have Washington. I'm sorry. You I'm wouldn't. sorry. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. Based on strength of schedule, you'd put Ohio State in there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you could do that. And a conference that no longer exists, and a couple of field goal victories over teams that yeah. are barely scratching by in the bowl. Because I would point out not to just rag on Alabama, but like 
Texas, great team, and they beat Alabama. They also they beat TCU by field goal. Yeah, yeah, right. And in Kansas State, and Kansas State by a field goal in overtime. Yeah, yeah. here's the right? thing. Here's the thing. So if, we, if we're talking about parsing everybody else's schedule, you should look inward at your own team that's now in the playoff and be like, maybe we had some shitty wins too. Yeah, I think, old man, I think that at some point you should probably get a vote along with the rest of the committee. But this year, I'm actually very excited to watch a matchup between Nick Saban and Jim Harbaugh. I think that it's going to be well. I mean, that is the best. I think the biggest problem for me is that ultimately one of these two teams is going to end up playing either. Washington or mm-hmm. Texas, which in my view, look, they're both great teams and you can make an argument that they're the better team than Florida state. They're not better than Georgia. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they're not better than Ohio state. So again, I think to use the old man's analogy here, you could pick the four best if you wanted to, which is what they claim to be doing here. Mm-hmm. Or you can go traditionally and pick, pick, conference champions but they didn't do either one of those and things. if you don't do either one of them because they picked a conference champion in the pac-12 yeah and then they didn't p- pick F- florida state so so they didn't they didn't agree on a single principle they just sort of did it by magic <laughs> but you it's know? a series of problems that will be solved next year when the playoff expands to 12 teams yeah uh, but we're okay yeah but okay that's 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 fine but again it just sort of worked out for the sec again <laughs> and i get last year it didn't work out for them but like most of the years it somehow figures out a way to work out just to put a finer point on this because i think like i saw a lot of people Old man cares about this issue very yeah, deeply because i just find it to be so hypocritical <laughs> it's, it's just so hypocritical to be like i don't know florida state you know not a complete team anymore because they don't have a quarterback thrown for 200 300 yards a game they just have a phenomenal defense and a bunch of playmakers who somehow won them all of those games I'm just going to read you Auburn's stat line against uh, Alabama in the Iron Bowl the previous week. <laughs> uh, the starting quarterback for Auburn was 5 of 16 for 91 yards with one touchdown and two interceptions. And Alabama fans are like, Florida State could never play in the playoff. They almost lost to that. They, they needed a Hail Mary to beat that. We're going to get so much hate. I don't care. I don't care because it's hypocritical. And and, and, and and again, I think the committee, I can understand the committee's decision. And if you just played the odds, this will be, these will be good matchups and Alabama will be a good matchup for Michigan. And I get that Florida State maybe wouldn't be able to figure it out. They have a month. They have a month with their backup quarterback, highly touted quarterback. I think they earned the right to have that chance, even if it is a 20% chance that they could beat Michigan. Well, they earned that right by being undefeated. I'm not going to disagree with you. I also <sighs> And know, I do all of this holding a Katie Britt. I was going to say, yeah. it's a token of your, your good faith. Alabama, so and, whatever. And your gentlemanly conduct. Look what you've done. I'm disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I feel better now, so thank you for giving me that. No, I, and I, we needed to air that out before we got going here, because I know that that's been a, a thorn in your side. The other thing that we were talking about as it relates to football is, did you guys watch that uh, Philly Niners game? Oh, I did. I start to finish. It, did you happen to notice the, the I think he's a security guy? Mm-hmm. He's like the head of security for the Eagles, yeah. Dom something. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Dom guy uh, got thrown out of the game because he got in an altercation with a linebacker from mm-hmm. the 49ers. Now, typically that's not done. You don't see a lot of coaches or team personnel uh, get into any sort of confrontation with an NFL player, probably for public safety reasons, if right. nothing else. Right. But this, this, is a, this is a large gentleman. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's a, he's a very, very big guy and tall, too, and he was thrown out of the game. He, Did you notice that? Was apparently the, the NFL, there may be additional sanctions. There brought. might be. There might be. But I also noticed, and this goes for, for Nicky, because, you know, he comes in here on some occasion to talk about, uh, you know, he does the diversity here on the program. Yeah. Uh, Dom has an Italian flag sewed to the side of his eagle's hat. I did notice that. And so I thought it was important to address that aspect of it. Uh, Nikki, did you get a chance to review the tape on that? I did. I did. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're just going to play the music. Oh. Is it, Nikki deserves an intro. Wow. <laughs> Nikki Spaghetti, everybody. Nikki Spaghetti. Buona sera. Buona sera. <laughs> So I did get to see the tape, and that man is a true Italian. He's a true Italian. <laughs> Indeed. 
I assume we can't play the tape because the NFL is very litigious. Yeah, no, I don't think we can. Yeah, very yeah no, they, they're not going to. But you should go and Google and just see what this guy looks like because you'll know what we're talking about. Nikki, it appeared to me as though this man was ready. This uh, man was ready. At some point, he, he was thinking about engaging. As soon as the first hand started flying, I saw the his blood boil like marinara. <laughs> like, <laughs> just, I ha I have to appreciate I, I have to appreciate like a big a big Italian lug will be like in his fifties and seriously think he could take a professional NFL linebacker. Yeah. Which I just love so much. Well it's kinda like the Tony Soprano yeah, type yeah, yeah. deal where yeah. it's like you know, you can put the boots to yeah. to somebody no It's like I'm what. I'm not in shape, but I swear I'm super strong underneath this. <laughs> exactly. Racist. That's exactly what it is. That's <laughs> There's also a rule in Italian culture. It's you don't roll. You don't roll. You don't roll over. <laughs> Which is beating. clearly what Dom was representing there on the sidelines. I, who knows if he's back on the sidelines? My guess is that the NFL will probably have something to say about that. But mm. you know what? In other news, the board's back. Yeah. All of a sudden, Smasherton's got his fingers all over this thing. I noticed a couple of racist bombs and then the uh, the Italian music. It's like an old friend. <laughs> <laughs> Just back here on the desk waiting for us. Um, Lee Wolf really takes very, very good care of he's, his friends. He's like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart with that thing. He's just playing it. <laughs> he is just playing it, looking for a reason. I love it. All right, so you recall on Thursday's episode that uh, we talked about how we're going to have an upcoming episode that's a QA and a episode. Yeah. And so you got to send in your questions mm. for yeah. that. Just email hello at ruthlesspodcast.com. We've seen a bunch thus far. Love it. Yeah, I, is that I, right? I, yeah, yeah, they're they're good. We need to turn up the heat on the old man. Oh, if you, come are, on. If you are upset with Michael Duncan, particularly his take on the SEC and entire conference and American <laughs> sports. If you're upset with him, write in. Yes. Tell us. Tell him. <laughs> yes. I love we need now. to know. We're just using this as a way to grill the old man. <laughs> <laughs> get his blood pressure going. The famously discriminated against SEC. Yeah. I <laughs> write me an angry email. Uh, or Vivek Ramaswamy, if you want to write me one, I'll, I'll read that as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's get down to business here. Uh, you know what? It hasn't uh, escaped my uh, overview that it turns out, despite all of the rhetoric by the Biden administration, uh, anti-Semitism hasn't gone away here in this country. And as we said for many episodes now, it appears that Hamas has some kind of a constituency within today's Democratic Party. It is on full display. And we have a couple of clips for you. Uh, can we play clip two, Wolf? Clip two is where it is. So that hateful shit happened again. We go back to the great city of Philadelphia where protesters were gathered outside of a falafel restaurant owned by a Jewish family chanting, if you couldn't hear it, Goldie, Goldie, you can't hide. We change you. We charge with, you. Or yeah. We charge you with genocide. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a restaurant in Philly. They're trying to fill orders and make sure people can get to their seats and they're in charge of genocide. Well, give, give me a break. Well, like, certainly this guy's name must have been Goldie, right? I, I, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it was. I think maybe they were trying to say Goldie as some sort of slur. Did you think? Huh. Where's the outrage, Michael? Yeah, well, well I, it's, it's at least from the article here, it says that the chain is owned by this Mike Solomonov. An Israeli-born, Pittsburgh-raised chef. So, so Mike. Yeah. Mike is responsible for what's going on in Gaza. Yeah. Evidently. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the kind of shit that you would only imagine in your wildest dreams happened in the worst eras of American democracy in our history that stopped 50, 60 years ago. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, this is stuff that I can't even fathom is happening on the streets of America in major cities. And yet it's happening right out in the blue 
And you get people like Kamala Harris out there saying, you know, like, oh, what we really need to do is make sure that the Palestinians have got a new form of government. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not, it doesn't seem more deep seated than that, does it, Miss Harris? <laughs> I mean, wild, right? Yeah. It's just incredible. They go, this is just some guy who just owns a shop. They, they find out he's Jewish and they go up and, and chant Goldie. Go I mean, good God. Yeah. No, it's it's disgusting, and um, and it's only made worse by Democrats. They go, they go like, the, what's what's stunning to me is not only is this a bunch of like a band of roving idiots who are paid by some, I'm sure, left wing dark money outlet to show up. Well, in the we of found the night. out that there's an awful lot of ties between left wing dark money groups and these places that have sent money to, to outfits like the one you saw there. Yeah, and what blows me away is that not only is it just like lunatics chanting in the street, but there are actual elected Democrats who are on national cable television. I mean, not to mention the vice president of the United States giving a press conference. Actual cable television echoing these comments over and over and over again. And it, it just shows you that there is something much, much deeper in the left, much deeper in the Democrat Party than I think anybody has come to grips with yet. Well, it's so sad that it's now infiltrating places with left-wing governance in places that are not all that left-wing, but they've mm -hmm. got governing bodies that are. Uh, this is in Virginia. Virginia Festival cancels menorah lighting due to Israel-Hamas War. This was stunning to me. This was unbelievable. This is according to jpost.com. A scheduled Hanukkah celebration set to take place during the upcoming Second Sunday's Art and Music Festival in Williamsburg, Virginia on December 10 has been canceled, sparking controversy and accusations of discrimination. According to the Virginia Gazette, the event was meant to feature a menorah lighting led by a local community rabbi, was abruptly called off by Love Light placemaking the festival's organizer. Their reason for the cancellation was unexpected uh, as they cited concerns about the Israel-Hamas conflict. Lovelight placemaking claimed that hosting the Hanukkah celebration would imply support for the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. It's just like there's there's a menorah every every time around, every time this, around this year or every year around this time there's a menorah that's lit somewhere in like basically every single neighborhood every single school district and yet now they're not allowed to do it I don't, because it, Hamas, is a, it's not a political state. It, it's not. It's not it's a like political a norm, It's a normal American thing that's done and the left hates america i i just like it goes much much deeper than just their hate of jews which they hate jews they hate america they do not want this country to succeed they do not want people who are different from one another to get along they want to take over and i mean i can go on and on and on on this subject i don't want to like get too far afield here but it is it's horrifying well it's disgusting but you know to the point that you made and that duncan made about who's bankrolling all this stuff there was a Washington Examiner piece entitled Hamas Friendly Protest Groups Bankrolled by Democratic Dark Money Juggernaut. Mm. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so an anti-Israel activist hubs leading protests sympathetic to Hamas across the United States after the terror group's recent deadly attacks against the Jewish state can thank an influential left-wing dark money nexus for helping to keep their lights on, documents show. The Tides Foundation and Tides Center two affiliated deep-pocketed nonprofit organizations that have long shaped the progressive agenda uh, with philanthropist backers such as George Soros and Bill Gates granted at least $1 million combined in 2022 uh, to groups behind the demonstrations pushing for an Israel-Gaza conflict ceasefire and downplaying Palestinian terror in the Middle East. Wow. I mean, so we look, we have said, and you've taken our word for it, that there's a constituency within the Democratic Party for her, for Hamas. But these are the groups that we've been talking about for a couple of years, as long as you've been listening to the Ruthless Variety program of these groups, these nonprofit groups that serve as hub and spoke for a bunch of progressive left wing causes that now under a microscope of what's ha happening in Israel can clearly demonstrate not only progressive left-wing out-of-touch psycho stuff but downright anti-semitism yeah i mean uh 
I think what I'm trying to come to grips with, because I agree with you, like there is a constituency for Hamas within the Democratic Party, but like how much of this is a large portion of the Democratic Party and how much of it Just is allowed? astroturfed by these dark money liberal groups to take a small minority and magnify it, make it louder, you yeah. know? Yeah. I think maybe it's a little bit of both. And, and the scary thing is, is like, you know, the whole left is a bunch of lemmings, like writ large, and that like this sort of wag the dog exercise by the Tides Foundation may actually turn on an entire generation of young progressives into being like, yeah, that is right. Hamas is good. I mean, you saw what happened on TikTok with Osama bin Laden. I was just going like, to say. It's very easy to convince them. There seems like a lot of evidence to suggest that this would be a fertile ground. <laughs> Right? I mean, but to that point, can we play clip three, Wolf? We are lucky to be alive in the era of Imam Khomeini, where we witness these kinds of victories. Vic, Brothers this is sisters, in Michigan. The Operation Al-Aqsa Storm. That day that it took place was definitely what we call Ayamullah, one of the days of God. It's true, the brothers who were there, they planned, they trained, they made every effort, blood, sweat, and tears, but they will be the first to tell you it was the help of God that made that social miracle come true. Oh, a um, miracle. The terrorist attack was a miracle. Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah. I, I just I have I have such a tough time with these things. I have a tough time with these things because look, I, like I'm a biggest First Amendment guy there is, and you can say all the crazy shit you want and everything else. But look, there was a time in this country where you took that kind of shit super seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started get, getting started in, in politics, when you had groups that were calling terrorist attacks a mission from God. Mm -hmm and praising what happened to innocent women, children, people of all shapes and sizes in those kibbutzes, and, and saying that that was good, that those were good things. Like, I, I mean. Yeah, I mean, usually it was in another country. It that, used to be, that used to be black <clears throat> site material. But then, all, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess, like, what also scares me the most about stuff like that, like, because that is, like, reprehensible and repulsive shit. But you pair that with the fact that for our intel community and the FBI and law enforcement, at least if you listen to the talking heads that are on MSNBC and things like that, like the number one threat to them in America is the domestic terrorism of Christian nationalists and you yeah. know, white, well, they still white say, radicals. They've testified before Congress mm -hmm. that that's the greatest That's threat. the greatest threat to America. Right. Not that guy. Not that. Not that. Not that. What we just saw. No. That is not the greatest threat. It's like the parents who show up at the PTA meetings I, in, in, in Loudoun County, Virginia. Like, they're the greatest threat. Well, and it's, it's what you imagine you get as a mixed message out of an administration that has to set priorities for these sort of things. Mm -hmm. When you have a vice president that's out like, well, we just need to, to arm the Palestinians, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you've got both sides of the mouth out on Biden. You've got a Democratic Party that's deathly afraid of losing a progressive, young progressive constituency that somehow TikTok has convinced is should be on the sides of, of, of Hamas. Like, this is scary territory to me. I mean, this is this is really jarring mm -hmm. stuff. It's, no, it's awful. It's awful. And it's not just on the local level where you've got this guy in Dearborn, Michigan. You actually have federally elected officials who are echoing basically the exact same sentiment. Did you see Pramila Jayapal? Yeah, let's check that one out. That's clip three. I've seen a lot of progressive women generally speaking, they're quick to defend women's rights and speak out against using rape as a, as a weapon of war, but downright silent on what we saw on October 7th and what might be happening inside Gaza right now to these hostages. Why is that? 
rape is horrific, sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Terrorist organizations like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. Mm -hmm. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestinians. Yeah. 15,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli airstrikes, three quarters of whom and it's, are women and children. And it's horrible, but you're, you don't see Israeli soldiers raping um Well, Dana, I think women. we're not, we're not, I, I don't want this to be the hierarchy of oppression. The irony, the hierarchy of oppressions is so funny listening to her. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, this is real. This is the squad you're here. Yeah. From, right. I yeah. mean, this is this is their point of view, which is maybe a more polished take than we saw from the imam there. Right. Comes from the same place. I mean, it, how is it that you could ever look past ever look past what's happened there? I mean, if you're supporting these are, by the way, the, they were first in line to talk about the Me Too movement. Mm hmm first in line to try to what is it believe believe all women believe all women we're going to believe all women first in line right and yet somehow when we're dealing with a act of terrorism mm -hmm. they can't find it within themselves to just simply condemn i mean look dana gave her every opportunity right. on that show to just say this was awful. It should never happen. Those people should go straight to hell for that. Right. And I just, it's so stunning that she didn't say that. She, I mean, that was the obvious answer that what Hamas did was disgusting. You these need things to move them out, these of, things, out of the way. You these things to... happen in war zones, you know? Like, come on. I, I don't know. They, they are, it, it goes back to your point, Josh, that there is a constituency within the Democratic <clears throat> Party that is Hamas, and it is growing. I mean, no, yeah. no politician response you know responds in that sort of a way unless that's the truth yeah i mean they're scared of some constituency which is frightening i mean terribly frightening and you contrast that with what we've dealt with in the last six years with like the trump administration for example on every single time there was a white supremacist leader who had said incredibly disgusting things anywhere in this country and then also said that they like donald trump right there was this inference constantly on cable news uh that the two were hand in hand right that they were one and the same uh, well unless you don't condemn then you're accepting that person's support in fact you agree with them that was the standard that was set in the trump administration right so where is that now yeah where is that doesn't exist like what and, and you can see part of the reason why the Biden administration has been given the space to do, on one hand, Kamala Harris out talking about a revitalized PLO and helping Palestinians and urging the end to hostilities in Gaza. And then Biden on the other side saying, basically, we stand with the people of Israel is because those questions aren't being asked at all. Right. Like, no, everybody's like, Hey, can you square that circle? And the only reason there's been any accountability for anybody and the reason that the university presidents have had to offer 17 statements over the last six weeks about this, about their own behavior in their own campuses, is because major donors have stepped up and said, well, I'm not giving another dime. Mm -hmm. So they feel like, okay, well, we got to rework this because I don't want to cut myself off from the spigot. But within the Democratic Party, the only people that are holding them accountable or could hold them accountable for this are the press and they're just like other than that dana interview i don't think i've seen anything like that. yeah i mean the institutional foothold that the left has in this country is absolute i mean it's in the media it's in the government in the deep state that everybody always talks about they people are so far left and there is such an imbalance of representation of half of this country's views and i mean hats off to dana for asking that question and for pressing a member of the squad on that you know, Jake Tapper, honestly, has been has been pretty good on this issue over and over again. It's not just coming from Fox. There are reporters who are out there who are pressing Democrats. But by and large, media organizations are completely consumed by the left inside of these newsrooms. Names you've never heard in your entire life that influence what stories are told are coming from left wing voices. And like until there is a balance in the media 
we're going to continue to get the same sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. And we're going to stay on it. I don't care how long it takes. We're going to stay on this on the variety program. But we like to break it up with fun. And we, it's been a long time since we've played a game outside of King of the Hill, fellas. Yeah. And I think it's about time we do that. Uh, what would you like to play? Uh, well, Nikki Spaghetti and the Wolf cooked up. Uh, oh, they did. They cooked up a nice round of uh, Mad Libs. So we're going to play. Oh, that. it's been a long time since we played Mad yeah, Libs. We're going to play that. Let's uh, let's hit that music. Mad, 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 lay mad, 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 lay mad, mad, mad. Mad, 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 so very mad. Ooh, 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 ooh. Mad, 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 lay mad, 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 lay mad, 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 I love that. Hedderberg really bringing the heat up. Bringing the heat. And we, I think we recorded that back in like the old conference room days. Oh, yeah. No, that was definitely back in the old conference. As I think all the songs Yeah. Like tin cans and twine. I love it. Well, it holds up. It holds up. Uh, who's administering this game? I am. I, I will be hosting the game. You okay. will be playing along with our fen- friend here, John Ashbrook. Um, so just to remind our audience, it's been a while since we played this, but what this game entails is finding some of the most horrific and ridiculous <laughs> takes on the internet, blanking out a word or phrase, and then offering my friends here a multiple choice for filling in that Mad Lib. <laughs> and do we get we get the name of the person to get, add a little texture to A little to texture. It? Okay. A little panache. Okay. So for those of us high media consumers, we can use our personality in, in mm-hmm. addition to the intuition and magic. Uh, try to get a little bit of competitive edge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Nikki, let's go to uh, the first graphic there. Yeah, this one is from Tim Alberta. <laughs> <clears throat> I can't believe you started this hot. Starting it super hot. <laughs> Tim writes, David Barton's fake history is one of the most disturbing and dangerous things I've witnessed inside the church. If you're not worried about the siren song of blank, you're not paying attention. Oof. Our, siren so now it's song. multiple choice? Our, yeah. Okay. Like our multiple choice options here are A, evangelicalism, B, Christian nationalism, C, radicalism, D, theocracy. Okay. Well, would you like me to start? Um, Yeah, you can start first in this round, and then Ashbrook will start first in the next. Okay. So what I know about Tim Alberta is that he started out as a well-intentioned, I would say, center-right individual who wrote, I think National Review is where he started. Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? Uh, and knew him at a time, as I knew people like Steve Schmidt and everyone else. Uh, Trump broke poor Tim Alberta. He happens to be a faithful man, and in fact, his his father, I believe, was a, a preacher of some kind. And one of the things that offends him the most is uh, the adherence of evangelicals to the Trump brand. Hates mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. I mean, hates it. Yeah. And so if you pop, can we pop those multiple choices up one more time? Oh, good. Without giving too much away to my competitor here, I'm going to go with B, Christian nationalism, uh, because A, I don't believe he would have a problem with. Radicalism seems too simplistic for Tim, and theocracy... Well, I'm not sure that he's that opposed to it in many ways. Well, he is, but I just, you know, it would surprise me if that was it. So I'm going to go with B. Okay. John? Okay. Um, for similar reasons, uh, is what is what Josh laid out, um, I was looking at B. Um, I don't think uh, C or D. Can we pop those back up again? I just want to look at C, radicalism, D, theocracy. For similar reasons, I don't. I don't know that those two apply, but I do know that he has a new book out, and I do know that part of the objective of the new book is to upset the system that has created what he is so upset by, and the system that upsets him so much has been termed in modern mm. mainstream media as evangelical Christianity, 
And I am going to say A, uh, just to differentiate myself a little bit from my competitor. And also um, bring some uh, personal insight into but it. But I, I think that I think that with this new book, not only is he trying to point out the problems with Trump Christian nationalism as he sees them, I think he is trying to upset the entire uh, system uh, of of conservative Christians on the right, and so he's he's picking a term that goes right at that. So I'm going to say a. Okay, what do we got? The answer is theocracy. No, oh, you're kidding. Really? Yeah. That's fantastic. Siren song of theocracy. Theocracy. Which is, it, it, but the, here's the reason it doesn't make any sense to me. There's a lot of critiques you could make about Donald Trump. Him instilling a theocracy is not one. That I, I don't can think imagine. it's very likely. Yeah. Right. I don't think so. Right. And, and the the guys who he's talking about are are making money on giving speeches to people. I I really don't think they're trying to bring theocracy to to america well if they're literally did, trying to continue if, if that's what raising you wanted you pick the absolute worst vehicle you could ever imagine right, right. donald trump is not a vehicle for theocracy it's the guy who attacked the heartbeat bill <laughs> <laughs> and you're like he will bring he will bring theocracy this to america a, this is this is a guy where if emily's list came out tomorrow and fully endorsed donald trump's candidacy and sent him four million bucks I'd love to see what his answer is on pro-life. Yeah. I'd love to see it. I'm not sure it would be exactly the same as it is now. That is, that is, that's stunning. Okay. Let's go uh, to number two, Nick. Okay. This is from Ben Collins. Oh boy. Frequent uh, target of the variety program. <clears throat> There's no take backs on blank. No easy undo button. You don't get a do-over on both sides in the big old whoopsie of mass suppression and cruelty. Oh, boy. Not adequately portraying the threat is both awfully short-sighted and almost always viewed as complicity in the eyes of history. Oh, God, I don't, I can't, no, no. Let's see the old multiple oh, choice here. No, no, I don't even, I, We have uh, theocracy again. Oh, okay. God. We have dictatorships. We have fascism or nationalism. Those are your four options. Okay. There's no take backs on blank. No easy undo button. Okay. Um, all right. This is very difficult. Um, however, Ben Collins is a creature of the left. He rose up while Trump was president of the United States as an outlet for libs who wanted to basically say that anything being reported that they disagreed with was misinformation yeah. uh lee, lee could i ask you to put that up one more time let's just keep just it so up. that I, just so that i'm looking at the right thing uh i think dictate so i think i don't think theocracy is what he's going for there i also think dictatorships is just a little bit too much um i actually think fascism is the word that he would use because it has been a, a touch point for the left over and over and over again. They have tweeted no word more frequently than fascism over the past couple of years because they're trying to will something into the conversation. And so I'm going to say, see fascism. Hmm. So I would have, that's definitely what I would have chosen. I'm seeking to try to draw some contrast with my friend here so i'm looking through this uh you don't get do over on both sides in the big old whoopsie of mass suppression and cruelty for that in and of itself i mean look i think he's talking about fascism but the the whoopsie component of this um I think we're going to go nationalism. I think mm. I think I'm going to go D on that one. Okay, let's show the answer here. It's fascism. Yeah, <laughs> I figured. I figured as much. I mean, there was no easy way out of that. No. And I was going to contrast it. Ashbrook's reasoning was sound. The only reason that I thought maybe it could be is because he's so insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like this, yeah. we're not Put, dealing pushing with the it. envelope even further. Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna, if your goal is max retweets, yeah, which is probably the goal of a lot of these guys that would be a real humdinger as they say 
Well, we got some more humdingers for you here. Okay, uh, I got to tie this thing up. Let's play the third one. Jennifer Seibel Newsom. Mm. Are we about to become the blank? Are there enough in the Electoral College with a conscience to change the outcome? <laughs> this is a this is a throwback to 2016 for our audio only listeners. Again, I would say are we about to become the blank? Or are there enough in the Electoral College with a conscience to change the outcome? She's, of course, referring to Mike Pence. <laughs> <laughs> the great, great throwback here pick from Nikki Spaghetti and the Wolf. Uh, okay, what do we got? Let's see our options. United States of Putin. Oh, gosh. Divided States of Russia. Satellite States of Moscow. Putin. Puppet States. There's a theme there. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, this is nearly impossible. I mean, it is nearly impossible because it's all about, and I, I'll confess that Jennifer Seibel Newsom is not one that I have on my timeline. So I have a difficult time working in her uh, vernacular. But, uh, oh, the divided states of Russia sounds pretty good to me. I'm going to go with B. Hmm. I like that, Gus. I like that because sort of a little play on United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what her creativity level is, frankly. I not mean, <laughs> not strong. <laughs> well, that gives it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you know, all four of these options sound very similar. Um, Putin puppet states. D. I, I, that seems a little bit like. I don't know. I mean, maybe she was just, you know, lashing out as liberals often do. Just wrote something that made no as, sense. As the as if any of these are are measured. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> um, this is December of 2016. Right. These right. People were at their wits' end. Right. Right. And they were already they were already pushing the Russia hoax. Um, I'm going to go with A, the United States of Putin, because. You know, I, you know. Again, I, I'm with Josh. I'm not a subscriber to the Cybel Newsom Substack, <laughs> uh, so I haven't, I haven't sort of familiarized myself with her <laughs> style. Um, I'm just going to go with A because. Well, it's, I think it's, it's when, he said, when he said she's not very creative, you pretty much eliminated no, everything no, else. No, I, I, I didn't. Okay, I'm going to go with the United States of Putin because here's here's another reason: the United States of Putin. Because this was the early days, remember, December 17th, 2016, the early days of the Russia hoax boomlet. So, you know, a year later, you might have had more creativity in what how they're describing it. Oh, yeah, this but, is like iteration one. But the left has to has to sell it's the Russia bullshit. Gate 1.0. That's okay. right. Okay. Let's see the answer. It's divided states oh. of Russia. Oh! Boom. Here you thought I was sandbagging you. You thought I was sandbagging you. <laughs> yes, I salvaged a tie yeah. out of that deal. Yeah. I well, actually, it. we have one more. Oh, we, oh, we do. Break. We do have one more, right, okay. Nikki? Yeah, we got one more. Oh, spaghetti coming through the tiebreaker let's, just when you need one. Let's do number four. Just like Dom DeLuise in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Dom DeLuise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Play the music. Play it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Our fourth one here is from Forbes. This is a, a, a tweet from Forbes. Three ways to blank in your workplace. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, who's the author? <laughs> is we this don't a, know. Is this editorial board? No, no, no. This is just one of those clickbait articles. Does Tubin have a, a, a seat on that editorial oh, man, board? I really hope not. Uh, our, uh, our options here. Let me see those, Nikki. Fight colonial, colonial, colonialist propaganda. Decenter whiteness. Oh, my God. Elevate non-binary voices. Support Gaza. Three ways oh. to blank. Oh, my goodness. In your workplace. Oh. That's all possible. It went a little different direction than you were thinking. Oh, that. yeah, no, I thought we were tubing. <laughs> and can, am I? You got to close a couple of browsers, Jeffrey. <laughs> you got 
You can't have them all going at one time. <laughs> okay, do I go first on this one? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this was tweeted. This is a tweet. Yeah, tweet from Forbes. Tweeted uh, on 11-19-2023, so in the hours ahead of Thanksgiving. Yes, very important. This is in the context of of Thanksgiving. I'm going to say, A, fight colonist propaganda in your workplace because oh. this is Thanksgiving. The libs hate Thanksgiving. They think that anybody who grew up in America is somehow a colonist, and I'm going to say A. It's a good take, smart take. So I don't think it's support Gaza because they have a little bit more. They, they use more Nuance. words for that. Hmm. Um, elevate non-binary voices is is fantastic, tempting, and, and, and very tempting. I think I'm gonna go with decenter whiteness because it just seems to me like that is if you're gonna try to blow the internet up on over Thanksgiving, I can imagine. Yeah. For, for, first of all, Forbes. Yeah. Think about the subscribership to Forbes. Right. Hey guys. Let's just sit, sit back, relax. I know you're getting ready for the holidays. Decenter some whiteness. Yeah, here's three. Here's three hip, hip new ways. Yeah. <laughs> it's it is a it is amazing how how the Zoomer liberal Slack channel of every media conglomerate in this country has destroyed media. Because <laughs> yeah, everything's the same thing. And think about it. Everybody's like, oh, wait a minute. I want to see if Forbes has no. Warren Buffett on the no. billionaire list. Nope. Nobody's thinking about that nope. for any other reason. Every, right everything is just the Huffington Post now. What's up, brother? Here we go. Let's decenter some whiteness. <laughs> 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 let's, see, uh, let's see that answer. It's decenter white. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Holmes. Victory. You know Victory. it. You Victory. Know it. I can't, I, from the jaws of defeat. Oh, what a wonderful I, I had game. Had a run there. We haven't played that in a while. No, I love that game. God, that's fantastic. Well, we thought we would just kind of break things up a little bit. It's been so serious. So serious. Yeah, no, it's you good know, to play a game. It's been so serious. We want to do a little campaign roundup. We'd be remiss. Listen, we take heat no matter what. Every campaign calls us every single week about whatever it is that we're going to say right. we're going to report some news mm. okay we didn't make this up okay not an opinion um the DeSantis super PAC which Michael you've had a lot to say since basically its foundation um is undergoing some change yeah shall we say and there was a big story last week about Adam Laxalt, the gentleman we used to work for uh, in his Senate run, who was the CEO, chairman of the outfit, and he had stepped down, citing family reasons, uh, still supported Governor DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That in and of its, itself, in a bubble, um, not an ideal headline that you want to garner, in a super PAC that has ultimately made more process stories than the candidate or campaign itself. Mm -hmm. However, in and of itself, uh, it is what it is, right? Well, they've lost the person who has <laughs> replaced Adam as mm -hmm. well. The super PAC backing Ron DeSantis' presidential bid never backed down, suffered a significant departure Friday when it lost Adam Laxalt. Now, the next piece of news here happened yesterday as Kristen Davidson mm. the CEO that's right I saw that that replaced Adam well and also before Adam left Chris Janikowski left the week prior to that right so right and there, was, and there was Aaron Perrine the chief <clears throat> spokesperson I think she was a communications director there mm -hmm. also out now there had also been Simultaneous to that, for those of us who would follow this closely, we haven't talked about it a lot on our program because we honestly don't like getting into the process. The media loves it because it distracts from the message of the candidate, particularly a Republican candidate. So we don't cover a lot of it. But before that, there was this discussion of a new super PAC that had started to run ads on behalf of DeSantis, that there was some interplay between Never Back Down and this new super PAC. There was a just there's huge contention there and that the mm -hmm. Santa's campaign was basically leaning towards the new super PAC as opposed to never back down, which, as you recall, was funded to the hilt mm -hmm. by DeSantis reelect money and everything else at the top. 
and has never really figured out how to inner work with the DeSantis campaign in a way that at least for public consumption has worked for the candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen on the ground in Iowa, we saw it with our own eyes, they have a hell of a ground team there. Yeah, yeah, they do. And so all of this may not mean a damn thing. But in the context of being in the shadow of the Iowa caucuses, having high profile departures, ain't great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I will say this. Um, it comes on the heels of what I thought was a very effective performance by Governor DeSantis last week on Fox News in his debate against Gavin Newsom. And I think that that's the problem. I think what you're I, just about to say is the that's the whole and, issue. And and I I think I think that if it's true that DeSantis has built the kind of field program in Iowa that we've been told he's built, that we believe, you know, we of course believe in the credibility of the marshals on the ground, you know, David Polianski and others, long time, very, very competent leaders in Iowa. If it's true that that organization is as competent as as we believe it to be, and if other people watching that Fox debate against Gavin Newsom had the same reaction that most other conservative Republicans had while watching it, I don't know that this matters. I think that a hundred million dollars down the tubes sucks. They, you know, if they actually blew the money and it and and DeSantis comes up short, they're probably going to get a whole lot of blame. However, if Ron DeSantis wins in Iowa or if he comes close in Iowa, I think it will be due to the governor's ability to connect with people that we saw firsthand that is not being reported in the mainstream press. Duncan, what's your take on this? Well, I mean, number one, I feel totally vindicated, <laughs> which is the most important thing. Because that's the most important thing. The, the, Just because it is. The most important thing <laughs> is that everyone who is attacking me on the internet for criticizing never back down is proven wrong, <laughs> which is the most important thing. Um, it's also, it's also, look, you're going to get a lot of things out of the variety program. Bullshit is not one of them. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is, is like you can attack us all day and sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we make wrong assessments, rarely, but sometimes we are. But when you make a criticism, it's not because you've got a dog in the fight and because you're... No, in fact, I, in the opposite. I want the best out of Ron DeSantis' campaign, and I wanted the best out of the Super PAC. And that was the only reason months ago that I criticized the strategy and the ads and what they were trying to accomplish. I like all the people that are running the Super PAC. I, I like the people trying to elect Ron DeSantis president of the United States. It's not a personal thing. This is professional. Yeah. This is business. And you know what? The stakes are really fucking high. Yeah. They're really high. So I hope nobody takes it personally. But the reality is they haven't served the governor well. A governor who did a great job in that debate against Gavin Newsom, as you just said. He did said. what he was supposed to Ashbrook, do. like he had all the facts and figures at his fingertips. He smoked Newsom in that debate, which is a hard thing to do because the guy's a clinical sociopath who will <laughs> lie about anything, yeah. right? Like, all, like a very, uh, what's that movie? The uh, he just Patrick looked, Bateman. Yeah, Patrick Patrick Bateman. Yeah, look. Yeah, American Psycho. That's that's it. this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hate him so much. Yeah. Anyway, so I look. Some of this is victim of circumstance stuff. Okay, and it it's not all on never back down, but I think what happens when the super PAC is organizing the grassroots events in Iowa, right? And they've got the bus tour and all of this, it becomes synonymous with DeSantis and the campaign itself. So when that is the vehicle that's running the ads that are, let's say, attacking Donald Trump, it's gonna kick some mud on the tires of the candidate himself, Ron DeSantis. That is a unique thing in politics. Typically, a super PAC has a much more of a distance you know, from the candidate about, itself. I hadn't thought about this, but here's something that's actually interesting. So because of the late entry for Ron DeSantis, the Super PAC was on the field for right. 30, 60 days before the end. They were the campaign. They're Ron DeSantis's brand. And if you know Iowa politics and the fact that like they want to meet every candidate, if the event is a never back down event and Ron DeSantis shows up and then you see a TV ad, and maybe you still like Donald Trump. It makes it difficult to separate the super PAC from Ron DeSantis. You know what else himself. did that last time we had an open primary? Who? Right to Rise. Yeah. 
I mean, it makes you wonder. Of, also a lot of money. It makes you wonder about the strategy. I mean, look, it is conventional wisdom within Republican operative circles that you stand up a super PAC, you raise as much money as you can long before you get a candidate in a race because there's unfettered sort of access to unlimited money and you can do all this and set the infrastructure straight. The problem is, is there's inevitable process stories associated with the filing with the FEC. Right. And then there's a bunch of stories about who's staffing this, that, and the other. So it becomes more about the operation than mm -hmm. it does about the candidate themselves. Mm -hmm. We've only seen this really twice. It was DeSantis and Jeb Bush on the presidential mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. right? Both of them, from that perspective, that didn't work out. You wonder whether or not going into future cycles where people rethink how you do that. Well, and, and just for our listeners here who might be unfamiliar with some of this from a strategy perspective, like typically you have a super PAC to do primarily run negative ads about your opponent, right? Right. Because it doesn't put the candidate's name doesn't on it. doesn't put the candidate's name on it. They don't have to say, I'm Ron DeSantis, I sponsor this ad, this other person's a terrible person, right? Nobody wants to have to do that. If they don't have to, they have a super PAC that can carry that water for them. But when the super PAC itself becomes synonymous with the candidate himself, he doesn't have that added value. Now, I would say this for Never Back Down. It's a novel and unique strategy to, to pay for things like ground game. field or organizing and ground game and stuff like that because a dollar's a dollar. Right? I have always I have always argued that long term this is the future of it, super PACs. It's it's a good it's a good strategy when you think of the fact, and again for our listeners, if you, you don't follow the ins and outs of this on on how the business of politics works, but like a super PAC does not get the lowest market rate for a TV ad. So all these super PACs spending all this money on television, they might have to pay five X, six X what a campaign itself pays for a TV ad. So I think part of this for Never Back Down was we're going to invest in the other infrastructure of the campaign where a dollar is a dollar, whether it's spent by a super PAC or spent by the campaign itself. So on paper, it's a, a better investment of resources than running TV ads that might cost you 7x. And let me just say, I believe in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's the right strategy. But what we're seeing, I think, is some of the there's an unintended consequence of that strategy. And that is when the super PAC becomes synonymous with the candidate. Now, maybe that doesn't matter when you come, like you get past South Carolina and it's TV ad war, yeah. right? And they're less familiar with the ins and outs of the super PAC. But Iowa and New Hampshire. But but in the two places where every single voter wants to meet the candidate himself, it's a little bit different, right? It's just a little bit different than all those other places where they're like, oh yeah, well, there's a super PAC ad. It right? also becomes, but in Iowa, it's, it's Ron DeSantis if it's never backed down. It also becomes more, there are more process stories about the operatives involved in running the super PAC because the candidate cannot, by law, direct the super PAC. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I mean, the Washington Post and the New York Times have spilled billions of barrels of ink on the operatives associated with never back down. And I can only imagine because that's, look, it's a ripe target for like the Trump campaign, for example. Like they can just go out and, and just annihilate people, operatives, rather than having to go specific, specifically against a candidate. We saw that in 2016 with Right to Rise too. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I mean, unless you have an entirely anonymous staff for a super PAC, this kind of thing is inevitable in major campaigns where you're going to have shakeups and turnovers and d discrepancies in strategy or whatnot, but it's become a big deal 90 days before an Iowa caucus, 60 days now before an Iowa caucus, because it was so emblematic of DeSantis's campaign itself. Yeah. And I wonder going forward whether or not... Now, like to your point, Ashbrook, there's a good chance it doesn't matter. Right. There is a really good chance it does. And I think the thing that's bothered me the most about all of these process stories dealing with Never Back Down and everything else is that DeSantis will go out and kill it for a week. And then the next week is nothing but stories about a process staff involvement in Never Back Down. And I'm like, well, how the hell is this guy supposed to communicate his message when the only thing that's being reported, and that's liberal media, is about the staff. Yeah. And it's happened time and time again. And to your point about the Newsom debate, brilliant stroke right. of brilliance. Right. He needed to capture for the first time 
since last February, the attention of Republican primary voters and be at the center of it. Mm -hmm. He did that last year. And the ratings for that episode of Hannity through the moon were higher than any of the Trump town halls that Hannity has done with Donald Trump through the moon, through the moon. Yeah. Like he knocked it out of the park. He did exactly what he should do. Yeah. And you're right. A lot of this might just be like parlor theater, just 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 gossip and stuff that ultimately doesn't matter for a lot of voters. But you do question the F, like the effectiveness of the current arrangement given the story. Yeah. It really stinks for a guy like DeSantis because he should have been introduced and maybe maybe he was and maybe we'll find out he actually was. This is a guy who we all remember during COVID stood against the entire society and said, no, we will not. We, we're going to reopen our state. We're going to operate differently than the federal government tells us we have to operate. And he was getting so much shit from reporters and yeah. so much shit from national politicians, on, honestly, on both sides. And he's the guy whose name is on the ballot. He's the guy who's being made fun of for wearing the white boots, going and showing up at the disaster site. And like he so he's stomaching that shit. And he's also like take it, you know, like he, he's he's been a very, very good governor in his state. Very good governor. And he's the kind of guy that if you put that if you put that personality, that image on the, on the ballot in Iowa, people will be like, huh, he's the kind of guy yeah. I really like. Yeah, I mean, look, he's an a exemplary governor. He'd probably make for a great president of the United States. The question that remains in front of us is whether he's a good enough candidate to win a Republican primary, and that we'll find out soon. One guy that we know is not going to win the Iowa caucus or a Republican primary, but is a very good guy and was a great friend of the program we continue to enjoy and hope we can have him on soon to talk about his experience governor doug burgum yeah he has announced that he will not be continuing to seek the republican nomination for president uh it is of no surprise i think to a lot of people who saw him as an interesting character uh had a little boom lit early on with some fundraising techniques and managed to pull above his weight a lot of different places. Um, and, you know, it was just fun. Just a fun, authentic human being who's a serious person who's done serious things and continues to do serious things in North Dakota. Uh, but he wasn't going to be president. Yeah, world-class individual. It's a shame to see him. Go. Smug, heartbroken. Smug. Well, in an incredible resume, like you alluded to, Holmes, like the guy's done incredible things, you yeah. know, both in the private sector and as governor. And we'll continue to be friends with yeah. him here on the program. And I like, I like, of a guy. I like that he didn't go out on those debates. He didn't, he didn't get the boom that he needed out of those debates, but I'm glad he got on that stage and he didn't debase himself with some ridiculous thing to try to get attention. That you know he doesn't believe. That you know he doesn't believe. He yeah. ran, he ran as himself. Yeah. And I really appreciate that about the guy. He's 100% authentic and he made the right decision. I, there's just no question about it. He's, he's a first class individual. I will tell you right now, as I have for the, uh, I'm going to preview my Thursday take. He's going to be my winner of the week <laughs> because I always take the guy who recognizes reality and gets out consolidates his field and makes it a real deal. So yeah. I'm going to save you the suspense on that. Oh, look at that. Uh, all right. Bidenomics. Mm -hmm. Guys, have you followed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is so good. Have you followed the incentive? I, I feel, first of all, I feel like Nostradamus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We called this the moment, the moment that they, we got the first story off the presses mm -hmm. that they were going to rebrand everything dealing with the economy as Bidenomics. And we laughed. And, and we, we laughed. laughed. Yeah. <laughs> And we started talking about how dumbassery this entire thought process would be. I mean, I know where it came from, right? I mean, it's like the same people who were like so afraid of Obamacare, but then all, ultimately they felt like they started winning on it. And they're like, well, let's just embrace it from the beginning. Yeah. Never minding the fact that like none of this works. It's all complete dumb fuckery at the highest level and so the messaging in and of itself has become a great consternation it, within you know the they all they, Party. they also have a closed feedback loop that consists of liberal democrats in the white house and liberal democrats that report on the white house mm -hmm. and like if they're talking to them the liberal democrats in the press are like oh you know what it really is a lot better than anybody thinks it really is you know the economy right. really isn't in such bad shape right and therefore, you need to be proud of the things that you should talk. And and they're like, like it, it, it does damage to them. 
this is this is another example. We've talked about this a lot on the show. It's another example of how an easy press corps actually does damage to Democrats in power. And- it does. It does. Well, I mean, look at so the, here's this is where the rub comes in. This is according to Axios yesterday. House Democratic leadership stopped pushing the term months ago. We're talking about Bidenomics. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and the House Majority Packet, two key fundraising arms, also avoided using it on social media and press releases. As polling indicates, the tagline is ineffective. Oh, who could have guessed? (laughs) Who could have guessed? In a meeting this past summer to discuss economic messaging strategy, House Democrats decided to stick with people over politics, quote unquote, Rather than Bidenomics, one senior Democratic leadership aide told Axios. The Bidenomics catchphrase seemed to present a host of issues, according to Democratic sources. The term was seen as tone-deaf to voters, (laughs) still struggling economically, and also (laughs) invoked a president with a lackluster polling. Uh, One Democratic strategist said the biggest problem wasn't using Biden, but the term was too philosophical and required too much explanation. Democrats across the board intend to keep many of the policies associated with the Bidenomics tagline font. Oh, what a great line. Uh, and what set, a great line. Heading into 2024. I got to finish this before we react because it's all so good. Some Democratic lawmakers have publicly expressed concern about the messaging tactic over the last few months, even as they plan to campaign on economic success. We have to do a better job. This is the, I mean, if you listen Classic. to the program, if you listen to the program, you're laughing and you're laughing. Yeah. We have to do a better job framing this is mm. not so much about one person for the office of the presidency, but for the people, said Stephen <laughs> Horsford. That's a Democrat from Nevada. He told Politico in September. In a major New York Times Siena poll in battleground states last month, voters were far more likely to say they trusted President Trump over Biden on the economy. The term Bidenomics does not appear on any DCCC's public press releases, nor social media, <laughs> site X, at all. Right. I do love it. They're I, like, thanks. I, 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 thanks, I lo- but no thanks. I love it. <laughs> it's like, as <laughs> I, there, there are certainties in life. There's death. There's taxes. And there's a Democrat thinking the problem is framing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the policy. It's not the person trying to sell it. It's that just the communicators haven't properly framed the issue. Why is everybody so focused on the rapes <laughs> and the murders when the Palestinians have been oppressed forever? Yeah. It's all the framing. It's right? all the framing. It's the framing. But it's well, on that- everything. And the economy is always since the beginning of time been democrat a1a reframe it is so i was gonna say i was gonna say this as well the people over politics line feels like an old clinton line dude doesn't it well it's not exactly hemingway yeah (laughs) if they're if they're talking about reframing and how they got this brilliant idea to overcome the fact that the economy sucks and it's people over politics there's absolutely nothing novel about that formulation right right. i mean there's think about it's just soft people over politics it's just soft-headed pablum is there not is there not one creative gene in that entire building i mean it's look a lot has been written about our time in the senate and in republican politics and branding certain things and but we put a lot of time and effort into it right you know and we we try to think outside the box and think about what resonates we were reading you know like what pulled 51 and jamming a square peg into a round hole but like as a communicator when you're coming up with what you think is going to be the bumper sticker for something as important as your view of the world right for the next two years right Imagine coming up with people over politics. Yeah, we we have just an, imagine we have an old man who can't say anything right, <laughs> and he's running against a populist. You know what we need to do is say people over politics because then they'll think he's actually the pot. Like what what in the world is the thought there? Well, I, the thought is, and I can tell you, just growing up in communicator circles, you use that framework, the people over politics, when your politics suck. Yeah. You never say people over politics when people agree with your politics. <laughs> right. You never say that. Right. Like you only say politics 
when you're like, fuck, there's nothing. We got nothing here. The politics suck. The politics. So yeah. people, how about that? Yeah. We'll do the people instead of Who hates of people? Yeah. It's, and everybody, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, roll back to like, well, everybody just doesn't like Washington. Yeah. Oh, they hate Washington. So that people over politics, it's like saying, you know, despite the fact that we have a codlock on control here in Washington, right. that we're for the people, no, not, we're not Washington. No, we're not about politics. No, God, no, no, heaven no, 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 no. But I think the other thing that sort of <laughs> makes it difficult, <laughs> makes it difficult to actually message the accomplishments of the Biden administration is there fucking aren't any. No. Like, <laughs> like what are you actually po- supposed to suss out from something you called the infrastructure or the Inflation Reduction Act yeah. that didn't reduce inflation. No, it's Green New Deal. Like, what are you supposed to say you accomplished there when it was predicated on a lie itself? Right. It makes it very difficult to have a bumper sticker of what success looks like because the the passage of it itself was a fucking lie. Has there been any process stories about Inflation Reduction Act? I haven't seen one like in a while. Like, who named it? I would bet my right arm that it's Chuck Schumer. Oh, that he came up with the I idea? would bet my right. So having been around the guy for 20 years and watching how they do that, like anytime they're in the impossible situation where they know everybody cares about one thing, but they're going to try to do another, it's straight 1984. Yeah. Right? It's like, no, just say that it does that. No, yeah, just call it the Free Puppies Act. <laughs> 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 like, sir, this is NDAA. <laughs> no, Free Puppies Act. It's Free Puppies. That's it. Yeah. No, I mean, I swear to God, that that does, doesn't that sound doesn't that resonate? It does, it does sound like him, and and I I actually think you're really onto something with the people over politics. Like when their politics suck so bad, when they're basically like we're raising your prices, taking <laughs> away your appliances, and making it more likely get murdered in major city in America. Like there's nothing to run on there, so you just have to make something up. Just yeah. make it up. Just make it up. All right. So this, all this, is the Wall Street Journal reports that House GOP moves toward formalizing impeachment probe of Biden. House Republican leaders are moving toward a vote on formalizing the impeachment probe into President Biden, aiming to bolster an investigation that some in the party are still wary of pushing forward too quickly. House Speaker Mike Johnson and committee chairman made the case to rank and file lawmakers on Friday with a vote possible as soon as this week. House Republicans have already spent months trying to tie Biden and family members to overseas business dealings and gather support for their claims, which he denies that he benefited from. They so far have failed to deliver evidence backing up their most strident claims about the president. Well, have they, though? Have they? Well, like, I- you know, I mean, that's the thing that I get with all these news stories. And I get what people are doing. Like, they don't want to, you know, they throw in something unless you see literally a bullet go through. The smoking gun doesn't work anymore. You actually got to see the bullet. Well, that's because they're Democrats. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, when they're saying support for their claims, which he denies, then he benefited. Well, here's what he denied. Mm -hmm. He denied they had any relationship, business relationship, with Hunter Biden. Can I read you? That, that's what he denied. So it, that there is no failure of evidence for. Can I read you a headline from the National Review? Please. Bank records show direct <laughs> monthly payments from Hunter Biden's corporation to Joe Biden. Oh, Bank would records. You, would you look at that? So, uh, so far they've de- failed to deliver evidence backing up their most strident so what's the most it, it, are we just dealing with the most strident i don't even know what the most strident is i don't know what would it ha- seems pretty strident i what mean he an era strident what, the only thing you get more strident is joe biden doing crack with the hookers with hunter like i don't know what else is more strident than the money literally goes in his bank account where's the strident bar i don't know what strident is is if the strident is like the tie foot job then i get it <laughs> oh, then i get it failure we're a family program uh, well yes but everybody's got to grow up sometime yeah I mean, I'm just saying, like, eh, feels like there's been a lot of evidence uncovered here. Yeah. And I don't know whether this merits an impeachment claim in the context of a general election year, but it certainly investigates and it certainly has an investigative role. And also, like, the mere fact that this isn't on the front page of the New York Times. Oh, don't get me started. In and of itself is the necessity to actually pursue all and and back to your point holmes i mean joe biden got on that debate stage with donald trump in 2020 and said i have no knowledge and my son 
did it make any money from China? We know those things are a lie. They're all false. They're absolutely a lie. So right. Jamie Comer in the House Oversight Committee should keep pulling on this thread as long as they can. But to your point on impeachment, you got to have him dead to rights. You got to. You, you, you have to. And, and we've talked about this previously on the show. And everyone's like, oh, well, you're just a cuck. Like, you don't want to fight. We like to fight. We want to fight the hardest. No, you really do have to have him dead to rights if you do an impeachment. Because that shit will boomerang back on you on Republicans if we don't have them dead to rights. Well, also just think about the dummy. I mean, think about it with your own partisan hat and and imagine what would have happened had Democrats never pursued a Ukraine impeachment against President Trump. If if impeachment was truly a novel thing and not something that you use as a political device as they did right. with that, would there have been a different outcome? I don't know if there would have been after January 6th, but it certainly would have been in the minds of many partisan Republicans, different in terms of why you're bringing the case in the first place. Right. I mean, at, like it should have some weight. It mm -hmm. should have weight. It should have weight. But, and, and when it doesn't have weight, like you said with the Ukraine thing, I mean, Trump's numbers went up. Yeah. During that impeachment. Yeah. Let me quote Jamie Comer. He's the chairman of this effort to investigate the Biden corruption. We got to have, hey, Wolf, let's get Comer on. We haven't talked to him. Well, here's what he said. He said that these payments are, quote, a part of a pattern revealing Joe Biden knew about, participated in, and benefited from his family's influence peddling schemes, close yeah. quote. Jamie Comer has spent a lo an awful lot of time investigating this, reading the documents, and he is getting the information that he needs. And I think that there's a lot of credibility that he has earned over this time period, and I, I can't wait to have him on the show. Yeah, I can't wait it either. I noticed uh, switching topics a touch, but staying on the Biden economy discussion a touch. Not the Biden economy where they pay money to each other from China, but like the broader Biden economy. Why isn't that this? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Same thing. Uh, John Kerry said there's no coal plants permitted anywhere in the in the world. Oh no! Mm. Uh, according to being quoted in the hill and i couldn't no notice but how uh, you went to twitter to provide some context for that discussion well reuters which is a news organization that is not widely known as a conservative outlet um <laughs> noted just a few weeks ago that china is building coal plants uh, a few months ago they noted that india is building coal plants and so somehow john Kerry is completely out of step with what's happening in the eastern hemisphere yeah. yeah, well, he certainly is, and so is everybody else. Do we have clip number four? Well, if I want to, I want to take a look at this. Is a uh, a in Munich, Dubai's global warming conference, and you're gonna love this. So these are P <laughs> PJs. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have happened to a better group of people. Who's into the tarmac? Uh, these are literally the climate people's PJs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> completely frozen to the tarmac. That one looks like it may have had some gear in the back. Because uh, it did the full tip over. Huh. A little back weighted there. Uh, a little tough on the old carbon footprint. Yep, yeah, yeah. Well, pretty tough to get that one off the ground. Yeah. They're, they're going to need some de-icing, as they say. <laughs> For those of you who've been on the, on the ground during the red foam. Man, you know the red foam when they square? That always makes me a little... Uh, makes crazy. me very nervous. Yeah. I, you know, I just don't like flying overall. Yeah. But... Well, you have the fly machine with you, too, so you never... I mean... I know the yeah. climate people are very concerned about chemicals, and I am confident that red foam is only hot water. Yeah. <laughs> it's It doesn't have any chemicals that would harm any wildlife. It just any puts wildlife. another yeah. inch on it. Just, it doesn't... Well, it's not going to have any impact on any wildlife in the immediate area. Well, if... If you get some, <laughs> if you get some runoff into a ditch, then it's then the USDA is like in charge of it now. You know? <laughs> Couldn't have that. Couldn't have it. Couldn't have it. Uh, do you guys want some animal news? Yeah, this is gonna be a little different. Uh, we're gonna go to the sea with this one. Red Lobster says unlimited shrimp promotion was too popular and too cheap. <laughs> You guys see this from NBC? I did not. Red Lobster's parent company, the Thai Union Group. First of all, did you know that? What? The Red Lobster is owned by, what, private equity? I thought I thought Red Lobster was a uh, the same people that owned, like, uh, what's the Italian? Chain? Olive Garden. Yeah, Olive Garden. Yeah, it's owned by private equity. 
It all is now? Yeah, I think so. Called the Thai Union Group? Will you Google that? Yeah, I think it's a you private equity would. group. I mean, that sounds like uh, join Hunter Biden. Yeah, my, my computer died. Thai Union. I'm, sh- I'm shocked Hunter's not grabbing checks from them right now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, they disclosed this month that the seafood chain took an unexpectedly large loss in the third quarter. You, uh, can, I, I, I have found this. They are indeed owned by Thai Union Group. Who, you were thinking of Darden Restaurants. I was, Darden, they, and they don't, Dar- they don't franchise. Yeah, they don't yeah, franchise. Yeah, they don't franchise. They don't franchise. Our friend, our they, friend uh, always reminded us yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. but um, okay, confirmed. So it's no longer owned by Darden? Thai Hospitality Group. Hmm. Yeah, well... Anyway, they've got a bad deal going. <laughs> so it turns out uh, that they lost a huge amount in the third quarter because of its $20 shrimp promotion. It wasn't very pro- profitable and was more popular than the company anticipated. The proportion of the people selecting this promotion was much higher than compared to expected, chief mm. financial officer said, of the Thai Union Group. As okay. I, as I said. Yeah. They're very... <laughs> I don't do it. I'm not going to do it. Don't do it. I'll, I'll, don't have the courage. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. <laughs> Red Lobster has an all-you-can-eat shrimp promotion for years, but this year it changed the shrimp deal from a limited-time offer to a permanent one. Hmm. The company wanted to boost its traffic in the third or fourth quarters of this year when business tends to slow down. Mm-hmm. You know what this reminds me of, fellas? Do you remember, I, I forget exactly what, but there was a story about why it was the McDonald's only offered the shrimp or the uh, the fish filet mm-hmm. rather than any sort of other seafood offerings. And it was an estimate that it would basically globally shut down seafood production. Like it would basically extinguish shrimp around mm. the world if McDonald's got onto this. Wow. Yeah. So is that the claim that Red Lobster is selling so many shrimp that's an endangered species? Well, they've lost so much money because they oh. priced it at such. Uh, a, oh, you can pe- eat because people love the shrimp. The people pe- love people it. love going to Red Lobster. The Admiral's platter, the Captain's platter, all you can eat shrimp is an American triumph. Yeah, and I like the I, coconut shrimp, the butterfly coconut ones with the spicy Thai sauce. Oh, yeah, with the spicy, the red spicy Thai. Forget about it. You can can understand why they're going from all-time unlimited to special-time unlimited. Well, they say, we knew the price was cheap, but the idea was to bring in more traffic to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, The company gradually raised the price on the shrimp from 20 to 22, and it's now at $25. Mm. Um so, but it's not it's not looking good for Red Lobster. They're moving through too many shrimp. Well, this is the reason why, when you're working in a food economy, if you will, that you need to hire McKinsey Group and Pete Buttigieg <laughs> to fix your prices. <laughs> so you get those shrimp cheap enough that you can turn a profit. Well, then you raise them for the average consumer. That's right. Which is imp- important. Very important. That's, that's the other side of the equation that can't be overstated. Here. <laughs> you got to make sure the average people can't get what you got. Oh, we're not fixing prices for you, <laughs> no, just John for Q. Us. Consumer. It's just, just for us. So anyway, the endless, uh, ultimate endless shrimp promotion is uh, perhaps on its way out. It's sad. Yeah. I like the Cheddar Bay Biscuits. And I think, isn't the strategy that they come in and then you come in there and then they feed you Cheddar Bay biscuits until you can't eat anymore and then they bring you the Well, that's the, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the Olive the Garden strategy. thing. The strategy with, with unlimited breadsticks. breadsticks. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. yeah. mm-hmm. uh, makes some sense. But you know what? I'd like to know what how the Thai Union Group got involved in that. That'd be an interesting sidebar. Anyway, uh, bear attacks everywhere. And, you know, we had a big consternation on the west side of this country over the last six months. Got a little hairy for the bears. Yeah. You know, got a little tight for Hank and his and his minions. Mm-hmm. They started apprehending a few bears mm-hmm. yeah. after a series of break-ins. Well, they've made their way to Japan. According to The Guardian, bear attacks in Japan hit a record high as hunger forces some to delay hibernation. Mm. The number of people injured or killed in bear attacks in Japan this year exceeded 200 for the first time as experts warned of more encounters during the winter when animals are supposed to hibernate. The environmental ministry said 212 people were attacked over the eight months from April 
including 30 in November alone. Holy cow. According to the public broadcaster NKH, six people died, including an angler uh, in the northernmost prefecture. Mm -hmm. It's a prefecture. Yeah. It's up there. Guard, it's a I guardian story. Yeah, I can't pronounce its name, uh, but it's a prefecture, so yeah. that's the important part that you need to know. Anyway, uh, whose partial remains were found close to a 1.5 meter tall bear. Mm. The bear that was shot dead, and DNA testing later confirmed that re the remains belonged to the missing man. Smash, you've long warned of the animal menace. It appears that our friends in Japan are taking the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. What shall we do? A modified version of the monkey pool. <laughs> Instead of bananas on the top of an Olympic-sized swimming pool, you need to put pots of honey <laughs> floating on the top of every pool, just all over. But bears can swim. They're good swimmers. Mm. Okay. You have an answer for the this. The pool is electrified. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes. There we, we go. Have the electrified pool. We, we developed this. Yeah, with, so, with the help of our audience. Yeah. Well, so he, he, here's, here's an honest-to-God real-life story, and I'm not making this up. I don't think I've told this on the program before. My family has always had a cabin in Canada way up in the center of the country. And you got to take a boat to get there. It's on an island uh, up on the Winnipeg River up there. Beautiful, beautiful place. But, you know, occasionally you get uh, a lean spring and there's not as many bountiful blueberries and such. And so the bears come roaming out looking for stuff. And it wasn't uncommon as a kid to see a black bear, large black bears kind of roaming around. Mm -hmm. Well, my grandfather used to spend his entire summers up there. And so, you know, when you spend an entire summer, you have food trash and things. And they didn't have, you know, a garbage man. Yeah. You get once a week or so, you got to bring all your trash to town, which is a long way away. You got to load that stuff up. There's a lot of planning that would involve yeah. in yeah. garbage. But in the interim, to do that, he had a big can in back mm -hmm. that he started you know, just having the can and they knocked the, the bears would knock the can over. And, you know, he'd watch these as these bears sort of savaged his trash and strewed yep. all around the Smart yard. Smart animals. So then he built a stand where he thought maybe it was like kind of too high for the bear. And they knocked that thing over and strewed the trash and everything else. Next thing he did is hot wire <laughs> straight from the telephone pole <laughs> right into his can just a full-fledged current and like this is a man there were not it's not like child children were not around right <laughs> there were plenty of danger here i don't even, i can't even imagine might how. be a bear might be a five-year-old i mean it's like i don't know how he did this yeah. but he did it right into the can and the next thing you know he was like straight up electrocuting like 700 pound bears on the reg but did they die oh yeah they died well some of them the littler ones did. The bigger yeah. ones howled the, like the Dickens. Yeah. And you could hear them like howling off into the woods as they, as they ran. They learned a good lesson. But, you know, over time, they learned not to come back to that can. Mm -hmm. So that is proof that the addition of electricity underneath the honeypots <laughs> floating on the top of the pool could actually work. I think that's true. I, one other thing I wanted to note in this story, which was particularly unsettling, they're coming... Like, they are hunting our hunters. It's it's not just that they're attacking the population writ large, but they attacked an angler. Yeah. A guy out there trying to feed himself on the bounty of nature. Well, perhaps impede upon his bounty himself. Yeah. So I, what I'm saying is they've escalated the war. Yes. They've escalated the war. Yes. It's yeah. like that angler wasn't there to hunt you, and now you've hunted him. So <laughs> we need to up our game. And another option is to commercialize it. One of the great things that Americans are able to do is commercialize anything. And so what we're calling on Red Lobster to do today <laughs> yeah. is swap your bear. unlimited, unlimited shrimp bear. for unlimited bear. Mm -hmm. I think, think that's Think right. about how many like cutlets of bear you could turn into a shrimp-sized like fried medallion. Yeah. Well, not only that, but Incredible. with the addition of electricity, you could also, also offer a prepackaged, pre-cooked yeah, <laughs> version. It's, it's immediately flambéed. Where all you need to do is pop that sucker in the oven like a hungry man. It comes, it comes <laughs> to you, it comes to you pre-seared. <laughs> Wildly good ideas again, fellas. I think we've solved the animal problem. Uh, we need to, with that, go to an animal lover and a good friend of the program, Dana Perino. 
I want to welcome to the program a friend that I have known for a very, very long time. She is just absolutely terrific. You probably know her as a co-host for both America's Newsroom and The Five, two big shows on Fox News Channel. She is Dana Perino. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's I, I love... I love podcasts because you came on my podcast, I come on your podcast, yeah. but a lot of people get to find out that we've actually been friends for over 20 years. I know it. Well, you said that you said the number. I wasn't going to do that to either of us, Dana. Well, well but... it's just like, it, it's, I love having friends this long. I do. I do too. I do too. It yeah. was, it's been wonderful seeing your sort of media, meteoric rise through the uh, journalism world. I mean, I, we both got to know each other, I think, when we were both working in politics and you were at the white house. I was in McConnell's office and Hey, look at you now. I mean, you're a big star. Look at you. Look at you. you joined, you joined the media world as well. In addition <laughs> to being a brilliant uh, strategist. I remember one of the things I remember most about you was of course I knew you in the McConnell office, but then what year was it that you went to Kentucky to run that race? Oh man. Well, I had to go a couple of different times. The The first time, <laughs> first time was in 08, which is, you know, and we were all so that's kind the of year I'm thinking of yeah. in the middle of it. And then I went back again in 2014 when we had all kinds of things going on both sides. And yeah, no, yeah. it's, it's, it's been, it's been a wild ride. But the one thing I can say is you've been a friend throughout your, what a lot of people don't know is you get all kinds of different media personalities out there, especially ones that have become as big a deal as Dana Perino. There is oh, nobody that I have known who's been more <laughs> humble and more willing to allow younger people to pick her brain about her success and oh, how to, wow, how to yeah. make it in this line of work. Oh, I do feel such a responsibility to take all of those calls from younger people. And right after I left the White House, I started that Minute Mentoring Group, which was like... Yeah speed dating but mentoring for young women and what's interesting is that you know, 10 or 15 years on those young women at the time now they're in middle to senior management or crazy you know having children and so now they have a whole other new set of issues that they're dealing with and i realized that oh i don't really think of mentoring so much as a formal thing but as a way to build friendships yeah over time well, and I mean, you've you've done that, but you've also bestowed an awful lot of knowledge upon people. Oh, know thanks. Well, I love it. And um, I feel that the culture that we came through, McConnell's office, the Bush White House, here at Fox News, the company you run, and as well as, as your podcast, right? There's a culture yeah. that you can help perpetuate. And it turns out, I was talking to Bill Hemmer about this today. I mean, I like everybody that I work with at Fox. I loved everyone that I worked with on Capitol Hill or um, at the White House. And so I think you and I are very fortunate that very we lucky. landed in those places because we both know people who don't have that oh, situation. Oh, totally. And and your career path tracks, right? I mean, if if you're starting at a, in a young age at some place surrounded by a bad culture, you can get poisoned by the profession, end up doing something entirely different. Maybe that works out or maybe it who doesn't. Who first work for on Capitol Hill? So my first, I came in for an internship in the house side, but then I, I started working for Norm Coleman. Um, oh, yeah, sure. On his campaign in 2002 and then in his Senate office. And uh, yeah, I mean, it started there. And then obviously we both worked with Ken Melman um, yep. for a number of years, which was very helpful before I got to the McConnell office. And, and I guess that's one of my first questions for you, Dana. I, I can't imagine knowing you and knowing your background, that you'd ever sort of envisioned exactly what it is that you're doing uh, when you were in your early 20s and just kind of getting right. started. What's interesting is that what I'm doing now at Fox, uh, being a, an anchor of a news program and having a chance, my biggest goal was to be on the panel of a Sunday show. Yeah. yeah. Like that's what I really wanted to do. And I started working in local news at, WCIA in Springfield, <laughs> Illinois. And I was looking around. One, I realized, wow, the only thing I wanted to really cover was the politics. I didn't really enjoy anything else. Mm -hmm. I even had a chance to cover a tornado one day, and I was not even really that excited about it. You know, <laughs> All this despite the fact that you're such a sports buff. That's right. And I, the sports, <laughs> that was tough. Um, I also could not see a path to get ahead. Mm -hmm. And I had ambition, but it wasn't to be, you know, 
to replace Peter Jennings on ABC Nightly News. That wasn't in my mind. I wanted to find a good local news market where I could be an anchor and do great stories and get to know that community and really be a part of it. But I started doing that work and I, I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And I had one of those crises of confidence saying, you mean to tell me I just got a student loan to get a graduate degree in something I don't want to do. (laughs) And the unconditional love of parents is so important because I remember calling my dad and being worried that I was, I had getting up the courage to tell him this. And I'll never forget. He said, not a problem. We'll pick (laughs) you up after graduation. You'll come back here and we'll figure it out. Oh, you got to love that. <laughs> so I did what every great graduate school student does when they finish is I went home and I lived in my parents' basement and I waited tables. But I ended up working through a series of events. There was a job offer in Washington, D.C. as a staff assistant, which means answering the phones, yeah. not answering the questions, <laughs> No, literally no. just answering the phones. No, that's the worst job in, in politics, and by I, the way. After about five weeks, I'm like, I know how to do this job. <laughs> my favorite job was when constituents came and I was asked to give the tour of the Capitol because then I could leave and walk around and get to know a few things and people. And it's actually because of sports that I'm sitting where I am today with you. Do you know why? <laughs> I'd love to hear this. No, I don't this know This is why. an incredible story, actually. It's one of the reasons I tell young people, always keep your eyes and ears open at all times. Also, leave your house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Because this work from home thing means you're not getting out there meeting people as much. So... I was working for Dan, I'm sorry, Scott McInnes, answering phones. And I'd been there five weeks. You know, you make no money on Capitol Hill. No. I had barely, I had just started making some friends. And Coors Brewing Company was buying tickets for anybody from Colorado to go to the first Colorado Avalanche game against the Capitals. Oh, you're kidding me. And this is right before the gift ban. So it was 19, uh, late September, early October, 1995. Okay. So the people that worked in McKinnis office said, Dana, are you going to go? And I was a little shy and I don't know anything about hockey, but it's free ticket. And I said, okay, sure, I'll go. And I sit in the stands and I'm next to a guy named Tim Rutten. Do you know Tim Rutten? I don't know that I do, no. Lobbyist in D.C. Okay. At the time, he worked for Hatfield, okay. Senator Hatfield. And he said, well, what would you like to do in Washington? And I said, oh, I'd love to work my way up to be a House press secretary one day. I didn't mean White House. I just meant House of Representatives. All right. And he goes, oh, my gosh, do you know Dan Schaefer of Colorado? He is looking for a new press secretary because my friend is going to be the chief of staff for Nathan Deal. And they're looking for somebody from Colorado with any sort of media experience. You're kidding me. That's how it got started? Well, I well, I said well, this, to his credit, I said, oh, my gosh, that sounds like a great opportunity, but I just moved here and took a job with Scott McInnes, and it would be really wrong <laughs> if I left after six weeks to go take a job with a fellow congressman. Right. And Tim Rutten said, oh, you have no idea how this place works. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Washington, sweetheart. <laughs> and so he said, right. and you know what? I will never forget, I'll never forget it, and I should get back in touch with him. I've touched base with him over the years periodically, but... He called the outgoing press secretary. He set up the meeting on the fifth floor of the Cannon House office building. She was the one who walked me down to meet the congressman. The congressman liked me, and he said, would you like me to call Scott McInnes and ask him? (laughs) And to his credit, Scott McInnes was enthusiastic. He knew that I was outgrew the staff assistant job right away. They didn't have anything for me to move up. And every single year since then, I will get a letter from Scott McInnes telling me how proud he is of me. Oh, you're kidding me. Really? That's yeah. that's first class. Uh, and it's kind of a long way to say, though, that I had no idea. But that's really what set me on the path to where I am today. If it hadn't been to go into that hockey game and sitting next to Tim Rutten, I don't think any of this would have happened. That's amazing. And meanwhile, you're sitting there uh, answering phones from constituents. But by the way, for for those of you who don't know, I imagine you can you could think that this is is in fact the case. Nobody calls a congressional office telling you you're doing a good job. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and what we had at the time, there was no email really, or e- email was very rudimentary. Yeah. Right. And so you, everybody so is the only law. way. <laughs> of the complaint. But do you remember the pink while you were out slips? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'll never forget this, too. That guy, Tim Rutten, 
I, I stay in touch with them a little bit. I Now I'm working for Dan Shaver. I'm the press secretary. My first day on the job, there's a pink while you're out slip that lands on my desk and it says, um, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes has called. <laughs> and he wants to talk to the congressman about the climate change bill. And I don't even know what they're talking about, but I knew enough to know that if Mike Wallace is calling, there's it's a big freaking deal. Yeah, that, that we, we need to pass that one along. So I wait and knock on the door gently of the chief of staff and show her the note. And she goes, huh? She goes, go to call him back. I'm like, okay, well, get another message. Mike Wallace of 60 minutes is called. She goes, okay, well call and just, just find out, just say you're new and find out what they want. I call and it's Tim Rutten's number. It was, <laughs> they were just joking. They were pranking me. <laughs> Going to see how you handled that press thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, you fast forward. And you are the White House press secretary. I'm sure there's a ton of stories of water under the bridge uh, between then. Yeah. But but the daunting sort of nature of that, and I, look, I think it's a little bit different nowadays, but when we both started in politics, being a White House press secretary was the coin of the realm, right? I mean, that was the yeah. biggest the biggest thing in the world, the most daunting. Yeah, you were really the only the only way to communicate. That was it. I mean, nobody, yeah. there wasn't, you could maybe get an off the record or something with, with some of the senior staff in some forum, but for the most part, everything public facing went to the press secretary. Right. There was no social media, really. Twitter and Facebook were sort of just starting mm -hmm. when I left. Yeah, right. So, so, I mean, I got to imagine that you're in that situation and look, the end of the Bush administration was challenging times, both with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and also, you know, the financial crisis and everything else. And you're kind of thrown in the middle of this to try to make sense yeah. of of all of it. Well, I was the deputy for quite a while. Yeah. And I always tell people 100 percent always take the deputy job if it's offered. <laughs> Can because learn, learn that's a lot. when you learn the ropes. Yeah. But it's not ever your fault. <laughs> right right I'm, I'm just the deputy here <laughs> so i was the deputy to scott mcclellan and a deputy then to tony snow right and tony was not territorial at all very unusual in washington he was very happy to let me be the one that briefed the president for a press conference or for me to go to the meeting for him or for me to brief the press one thing you might not know josh is that at one point when tony needed to go for surgery uh he was he had cancer at the time he had to go for surgery, so I needed to brief for two to three weeks. And the young man, Carlton Carroll, that worked in the press office, asked me if I wanted them to build me a new podium for that time period. And I said, oh, gosh, no, that's such a waste of taxpayer right, dollars. Because Tony, hand... Tony was pretty pretty tall. Yeah, he was 6'5", and yeah. I'm not. <laughs> not not 6'5". <laughs> no, not at all. And I said, I'll just stand on an Apple box. So I did that for a week. I mean, I was mostly worried that I was going to start a war or get fired or yeah, embarrass right. myself or right. what I was going to wear. And on the next Friday night, Carlton comes and knocks on my door and he says, ma'am, I really think they have to buy you, make you a new podium for next week. And I said, oh, that, but Tony's doing better. He's going to be back sooner than we thought. We're traveling two of the days. The Apple box works fine for me. I'm low maintenance. I don't need anything. He says, well, actually... NBC News showed me the camera shot when you're at Tony Snow's podium on the Apple box. And the problem is when you stand there, the seal above your house, uh, uh, the, the seal above your head does not say the white house. It says the white hoe. <laughs> <laughs> For a week. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, for a week. And imagine if there had been Twitter or Instagram. Oh, just the worst. The absolute TikTok, worst. I mean, nothing. But I'll never forget that Rodney from NBC News was like, we got to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> I was friends out. with all those guys and the crew. Oh, man, that's incredible. But, you know, but, you... Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was an amazing job. The job changed my life. I learned so much about politics, foreign policy, but... I also learned a lot about loyalty and life and character mm -hmm. and integrity, dignity, hard work. Right. You know, and also, I just, I loved all the people that I worked with to this day. I talked to them many times. I just got the phone with one of them uh, right before we did this podcast. I have you as my friend. And the thing is, I know that I could go, but this would probably never happen with us, but 
if I went a year without seeing you, I know that if I ever needed help, yeah, I could call you and it would be there in a second. And same, same with me. And yeah. the way that this has all worked out in my life has been really important. I feel like I learned a lot of that, certainly growing up out West. Absolutely. But really during the Bush administration, I, I feel like I found myself very grounded mm -hmm. and I have stayed so curious and humble uh, yeah. because I've had so many humiliating things like the white hoe, right? Just like, <laughs> just when you can get a big head, God says, oh no, <laughs> actually no. Yeah. It's better to keep yourself uh, on the humble side because there's always something in this line of work that'll force it upon you and, and if you're not paying attention exactly. no question about it so all right so we get to the end of your of your tenure at the white house like you said you wanted to explore media career and you were good at it and everybody saw evidence of that as white house press secretary but it's not just the media i mean i feel like you're the only person i know that despite all of what's happened in politics over the last 10 15 years your, your sort of career trajectory is always sort of in an upward slant. And part of that, I think, is with you associating yourself with people you trust and people who like you and you like them. And that's been your experience at Fox. Well, I would I have to say it's interesting you know, when we went through uh, the whole Me Too mo movement and watching this. And I know that a lot of that was real. Of course, I get I get that. But my personal experience has been that there has been a man in a senior position in my life that has pulled me up and said, new opportunity for her. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think about that with Scott McInnes, uh, Dan Schaefer, mm -hmm. um, certainly President Bush, mm -hmm. but and I would say Andy Card, Josh Bolton, right. Tony Snow, right? Um, but here, leaving from the White House to here, it was Sean Hannity. Hmm. Interesting. Sean said, why don't you come up and be on my show? What I didn't know is that here at Fox, he had suggested that they might want to consider me as a contributor. And there was a sentiment here, and I believe it did come from Roger, who said, why would we need another Bush Republican? We already have Carl. Mm -hmm. And Sean said, she's different. Let me try. I was so terrible at the beginning and shy, <laughs> worried. I didn't want to give my opinion. I felt bad being Because you were still doing the Rock. press secretary thing, right? I mean, for those who are not yeah, aligned in this. Anything they asked me, I would just like revert to being, well, well as the president has been very clear, <laughs> yeah, like, whatever, right, whatever right. I had said. And to Sean's credit, he kept up with it. He, he always had me back. And then Roger gave me opportunity. Mm -hmm. Once I was a contributor, then the five starts. Yeah, right, which and was a real experiment to start with. It seems weird to think about now that it's so popular, but at, at the beginning, I know, it was we've a been real... on the air for 13 years, and so Suzanne Scott's the CEO of Fox News now, and I think the world of her and of her leadership, The Five has been on for 13 years. Gutfeld and I are the two original people. Do you know why we are like such good friends and why we were sitting next to each other? It wasn't because we got to the table first and said, oh, let's sit next to each other. It's because we're the shortest <laughs> and the lighting had to be focused on the shortest people in that particular position. And that's how we became friends. That's incredible. I mean, the, the run that that show has been on is incredible. Because like I said, it was it seemed like a real experiment at the time. There was a time slot there that hadn't totally I mean it worked but it, it wasn't uh something that that lasted over a, a long period of time and then you guys slide in there and it just becomes this gigantic show yeah well at first like we didn't even we thought we were just going to be a temporary five-week show so we were just goofing around and being ourselves isn't that funny and I really do credit Gutfeld for helping me come out of my shell out of my press secretary shell yeah I remember one time he asked me what I thought about the legalization of marijuana and I went right into, well, the Justice Department has blah, blah. And he says, no, what do you think? And it took me back. And I at one point finally realized that this was a career that I wanted. Charles Krauthammer actually called me to his office one time and he said, you could have the big PR firm or you could have the career in media. Because, but if you try to do both, Mm -hmm. You're going to be pulled in too many different directions and you're never going to be settled and you will not enjoy your life as much. And he was so wise, obviously. Well, about and everything. Just about again, everything. But, you know, there's another example. Charles Krauthammer says, how can I help her? Reaches yeah. out. And I know that you do that all of the time, too. Um, 
So I've had a lot of people that helped me along the way. And the five, I think one of the reasons it's so successful is that we script nothing. Yeah, you we, can tell. Like, I know what the topics are going to be at five o'clock, but I don't talk to anybody, not because I don't want to, but it's like, we're all busy. Yeah. I might call you. I might call somebody that you've actually put me in touch with over the years, get their take. I listen to all the podcasts. I listen to you guys. Listen to commentary. Listen to Three Martini Lunch. Mm -hmm. Just get a sense for what people are thinking. And then I spend a little time being quiet. And the five is just where we sit down. We haven't even talked about any of the issues and there's nothing in the teleprompter yeah yeah well you get so, that authentic reaction which is what you know i think it brought to the fore something that we hadn't seen in major well, uh, we cable also had news humor right so yeah, a lot right. of times you know on cable news you wouldn't get anything funny but we would just like make gutfeld led the way and then we could just be ourselves and make fun of each other Te teasing is critical on the five <laughs> yeah. You have to be willing to be teased or to be the one doing the teasing. <laughs> no question about it. But I've, look, I think you, you stumbled upon a, a really good point here that's overlooked because I think both in media and in politics over the last 15 years, this is probably true forever, but it seems really apparent in the last 15 years, there's a lot of lo wrong lessons to learn about culture and about how you can progress your career. And I, I, it just seems to me that there's an awful lot, and I'm sure you see it every day, of people who are sort of learning the wrong lessons about media these days. And I imagine you attribute a lot of your success to those foundations that you just talked about. I think that if you're looking to, if, if anyone listening or watching uh, is interested in a career in media, or let's say you have a hit wherever it is, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, somewhere else. Um, authenticity is just key. Yeah, that's it. And talking points are so boring. Terrible. And you can spot them a mile away. <laughs> and nobody wants to hear them anymore. It, you really have to do the work to have original thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I true. think that is the most important thing that I've learned. If I watch somebody and I think, wow, look at that. Interesting. I'll give you an example. Jimmy Fallon is a Fox News contributor. He's uh, on the radio here, and he has a comedy special coming. This guy was a taxi driver <laughs> who yeah. had a he, he was a part time taxi driver trying to make it as a comedian. He got a shot to be on Kennedy's show. Oh, is that years how that ago. started? Okay, yeah. And he has the most thoughtful, wise ideas that he communicates in a way that makes you laugh yeah. i'll never forget he tells this story that one night they walked out and s with the other guests and they said we're gonna go to um we're gonna go get a car do you want to come with us he goes oh no i have my car here and they said oh you're taking a taxi he goes no that's my car because <laughs> <laughs> he still drove a taxi yeah right and he's about to have a fox nation special i went to the taping of it uh, a month ago and he's fabulous so i'm sure it's great especially the more that conservatives can bring a sense of humor and real life. Oh, you're to preaching to the choir. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. And of course, you guys do that every day here. Yeah, no, you're preaching to the choir on that. We've long, long believed that. Uh, one thing, unless people follow you very closely, don't know, you're a big country music gal. And yeah. uh, I know you're working on something. What do you, you got some, I always see you in Nashville and hanging I know, out with I country. Do love it. Hey, that's your so thing, I was it seems a, like. I grew up in Wyoming and Colorado. I was a country music DJ during college, making minimum wage, 3.35 an hour, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> but in order to work in TV, you had to start in radio. So that's where I got my start. Yeah. I didn't even have an iPod during the Bush years. Really? I didn't have time to listen to music. So it was after that, I'm riding the Acela back and forth to New York, and I have to get reacquainted with music. So... I've done that. And over time, what I've realized, I love the storytelling. As Greg Gutfeld always makes fun of me. He's like, you just like the lyrics. Yeah. And I do think the writing of these songs is so clever. Three so chords in the truth, Dana. Three chords in the truth. It's the best. Have you ever been to the listening room in Nashville? I have not. No. Is it just fantastic? Highly recommend. Okay. The all other right. one is the Bluebird Cafe. A lot of people go there as well, of course. That's where Taylor Swift got her start, of all places. Garth Brooks, too. But... I've come to know some songwriters and I'm getting a chance to do a, a few events. I helped one, JT Harding, 
who's written amazing songs. He's got an incredible adoption story that he constantly gives back. He's made it big finally over time. I helped him get a book deal. And that book is called Party Like a Rock Star. It's fantastic, mm. crazy stories. And then this week, December 9th, I'm doing a charity event in Kalamazoo for the West Cancer, West Michigan Cancer Center. And we have four songwriters who are going to present their songs in the original form Hmm. One of them includes the guy who wrote the dance for Garth Brooks. Oh, you're kidding me. Really? That's amazing. So you get to hear the story beha- behind how your favorite songs came to be. Jeez, and try not to cry, right? If it's the dance. <laughs> Good Lord. It's really fun. I actually know this one story about Blake Shelton. Um, my friend is a, pro- is a producer. That guy, JT Harding, with the book deal, wrote Sangria. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With... Um, Shane McAnally, they wrote that song together. And there's a alert that had gone out saying, no more drinking songs for Blake. <laughs> okay. But they're like, but Sangria is not really a drinking song. It's about a romance. So they keep pushing. Blake has it on hold for several years. And, you know, if you're a songwriter, if your song doesn't get released, you don't get paid. Yeah, right. It's nothing. So they're waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, it comes out. But when Blake went to record it, you know, I don't know if that song goes, your lips taste like sangria. Yeah. And yeah. you have to go, yeah. At the but the producer said that Blake wasn't doing that. Okay. He was just saying, your lips taste like sangria. <laughs> and it wasn't really hitting. Right. So the producer says, Blake, can you try that again and do the, the yeah? And Blake says, I am doing that. He's like, <laughs> He's like no, I'm from not. Oklahoma. <laughs> and he said that was the only argument they've ever gotten in in, in the entire career. Uh, and they finally got it done. But that is like, that's the kind of thing that you can learn at events like this. Oh, it's that so just fun. enhance your fandom. Well, everybody should look into that. That sounds like a great cause and obviously something you love to do. Uh, I've got three questions that I, I'm not going to let anybody out of here uh, with okay. ans- without answering, but particularly you, Dana, because I'm very interested. The first question is, your last meal on earth. If you can plan it, what would it be? I'm a, I love steak. Yeah. I grew up on cattle ranch. Yeah. So I'd have to have a steak. I have to have a steak. And if it's the last meal on earth and I don't have to worry about getting into my clothes the next week. Yeah. Nothing. I'll take the French fries. <laughs> Here you go. Load it up. <laughs> and Mint chocolate chip ice cream. I I find it so refreshing that we're not talking about some salad or oh, some no. smooth. I mean, we're this is a real meal here. I always <laughs> look at my family, you know, cattle ranchers. I'm like, they're the fittest people I've ever seen, and they eat it every day. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> They've got the right idea. Also, they're not sitting on their rear ends recording podcasts all day. Uh, exactly. <laughs> they got a little bit more lifestyle difference uh, to yes. take care of them on that. All right. Second question is, with the benefit of retrospect, now you've had such an incredible, successful career that I'm sure will continue on for decades. But if you can look back the last 20 years with the benefit of retrospect and you have a blue sky moment where you can fill it with absolutely anything in the world that you may be interested in, what would it be? I am late to learn how to play tennis. Oh. And I I, I take lessons. Um, I take a lot of lessons. <laughs> I'm not very good, but I did get most improved uh, at the place where I take lessons this summer. Uh, I wish that I had learned that early on and uh, for a few reasons. I think it's great exercise. I think eye-hand coordination is really important for your life. Yeah. I really don't have a lot of it, actually. And... Um, it's something that you can do anywhere you go in the world and it's social and you meet people. And for the most part, I've found that the people that are playing, they don't care that I'm really not very good. It's a social way to get out there, be off your phone. But I, I wish that I could play it a little bit more than just taking lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you started that, when you started in politics and journalism, you'd probably be on the tour somewhere. I, I might. I might have just decided to go straight into sports. Maybe right. Dana plays sports. That would be great. I think that's especially we should look into anyway, though. Uh, 
All right, third question, final question. You got to stick with me for a moment. Our view is that almost every successful person is motivated by one of two things, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. It's not that anybody likes losing or doesn't like winning. It's what motivates them to keep going, right? Michael Jordan is the quintessential agony of defeat person who every championship he won, it took him like three seconds to get over. But if you insulted him, he wore it like a backpack his entire oh. career, right? The optimist does on the other side. Yeah. Glass half full. I think I can do it. That's why I'm doing it. Where do you think you find yourself in this ad- in this area? I think I'm a quite a pragmatist. Hmm. A pragmatic I... agony of defeat person? No, I, I would say... Uh, <laughs> optimistic. I always say that I'm not a very competitive person, but I love to win. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I'm prepared to lose. <laughs> no, you strike me as a, as a thrill of victory person. I think you're, you've yeah, always I do. been somebody I, I certainly who love that. gets into the arena. And especially to cheer on other people when they achieve something that always feels really good too. Um, I don't have too many things that I'm competing on anymore. We are, we are fortunate. You know, I work at a place that's been the number one yeah. network for a long time. The Five has been the number one cable news show for, I don't know how many months now, 10 months, I think, yep. we're going on. And I always sort of think, well, of course we're number one. But then I'm like, wait, what if we're not? So we have to work harder. So I do like to maintain a certain level. Yeah. Um, but it's always good to also be considered the underdog as well. You know that in politics, right? For like you sure. want to be considered the underdog. Yeah, you do. You do, but you like to prove them wrong, too. I, I President was not... Bush was always reminding us to lower expectations. <laughs> right, right. It's a good rule in politics, no question about it. Dana Perino, I can't thank you enough for your friendship, for everything that you have done and will continue to do. You can check her out on The Five or America's Newsroom, and you can check out all these special events that she's doing, too, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. I hope so. And please tell Smug, I hope next time, He's here. Yeah, I know. Can you believe it? What an insult. What an insult. Yeah, well, we have we have we have a history that's funny. We'll save it for the next time. We'll save it for the next time. Dana Perino, everybody. Thank you, Josh. Bush is just a legend in media, a legend on the Republican press secretary side, and we're very, very lucky to have had her today. She's also an example. I think, you know, in any line of work, when you look at the top top there's always a lot of speculation about how people got there. And in many lines of work, you'll say like this person is particularly savage, you know, like they'll do anything to try to climb the ladder and do whatever. Dana is somebody who has treated people fairly well, no matter where she is. And I mean, I say fairly in quotes because it's very well in terms of what I've been accustomed to, but somebody who's also invested in the people around her and trying to help them, too. And so I think she's a perfect example of somebody who does it the right way, who's a good, thoughtful person and somebody who it's worked out for in the end. And I think that's, again, in this world, there's so much, so much to feel despondent about, about, you know, everything around us. She's somebody who's done it kind of the right way. Hmm. Well, I think we do. Should we go to hen? I think we got to go to hen. I think got we to. do. We got to. All right, let's have Han sign this thing out. Another banger of an episode, folks. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. Stay ruthless.